Hello, and welcome to our video on ecosystems. So this is an alligator fighting with a python. Um, the python is uh, live. You can see its head, but it seems like it's in the process of being eaten by the alligator, or maybe it's squeezing the alligator to death. I'm not sure who wins in a fight between a python and an alligator this big, though I guess it's probably an alligator. Interestingly, this is a picture from the Everglades ecosystem, and pythons are not native to the Everglades ecosystem. They've become quite a problem in the Everglades ecosystem, but not probably so much for alligators of this size. This is a, another ecosystem interaction. It's probably a little bit more traditional and classic what we think of, right? Bees and flowers that they pollinate. These are all things that go into the functioning of the ecosystem, which is the network that results from the interactions between the living part of an environment, the community, and the non-living part or the abiotic part of the environment. Putting it all together, you have yourself an ecosystem, and that's what we're talking about here. How do ecosystems function? In this video, we're going to talk about ecosystem structure, and then we're going to talk about the processes of facilitation, how ecosystems change over time, and what happens when ecosystems are disturbed. Then we're going to talk about ecosystem services, the things that ecosystems do that organisms need in order to remain alive and functional, including us, before talking a little bit about biodiversity and where biodiversity comes from. This is a tour of the major terrestrial ecosystem biomes. A biome is just a large group of related ecosystems. Terrestrial biomes on the planet are basically determined by local conditions, functionally temperature, the amount of direct sunlight that the area receives over the course of the year, and the amount of precipitation, which is determined both by latitude and by local geologic features, such as mountain ranges. Hopefully you have some handle on how that works before you've sat down here in your advanced level biology course, but if not, you can check that out in other resources. I'll leave some below the video. Of course, most of our planet is covered in water and aquatic biomes exist as well. Aquatic biomes are determined similarly to terrestrial biomes in terms of latitude having an effect on sunlight and producer activity, but they're also determined by where they are in the ocean, the amount of sunlight that is received at the particular depth of the ocean, and other major planetary conditions that determine the characteristics of any particular major marine biome. Regardless of what the ecosystem is, no matter how big or how small we make it, no matter where it occurs, ecosystems, just like any other biological system, are dynamic interaction networks. They are an emergent property that results from the interactions between the community and the environment. And they are dynamic. They change over time. And we'll look at two different processes that drive the changes that we see in ecosystems. We'll start with facilitation. Hey, here's a cute little guy. He is or she is a beaver, and through her actions or his actions, she is changing the ecosystems in which she lives. By building a beaver dam in which to live, she's changing the circulation patterns of water in the environment, leading to the development of beaver ponds, which provide many, many niches for many, many different types of organisms that would not be there were she or he not present and doing the beaver thing. This is a great example of facilitation, wherein species in an ecosystem make additional niches in that ecosystem present and available through their actions in the environment. The other major types of changes that we see in ecosystems come about as a result of disturbances. And disturbances can be anything that disrupts the overall structure of the ecosystem. This is a forest ecosystem after a storm disturbance. Here is another mountainous forest ecosystem after a fire. These are disturbances, and they are going to drive a series of changes in the ecosystem, not only due to the disturbance, but due to the changes that will happen after the disturbance as the ecosystem recovers. Here is recovery after a fire disturbance. Immediately afterwards, we can see very little vegetation present in the environment. One year later, we can see that the ecosystem is starting to rebound. It seems that most ecosystems thrive when there is some level of disturbance. You don't want so much disturbance that the ecosystem can never rebound from the effects of those disturbances, but you also don't want so little disturbance that the ecosystem reaches periods of stagnation. Those kinds of stagnations can cause even larger disturbances than would otherwise happen were the ecosystem being periodically disturbed at a smaller level. Ecosystems with an intermediate level of disturbance tend to be more biodiverse than ecosystems with either tremendous disturbance 
or very little disturbance. One of the main reasons for this is that the processes of disturbance and facilitation lead to succession, or the changes that we see in an ecosystem over time. This is showing the successional changes in a forest ecosystem after a disturbance. You can pick your preferred disturbance in the diagram. It's showing four different ones, fire or human activity or a flood or some sort of radioactive fallout. But regardless, after the disturbance, the ecosystem is largely destroyed. But through the facilitation actions of the species that enter into the ecosystem after the disturbance, the biodiversity of that ecosystem and the complexity of that ecosystem increase over time, until such time as another disturbance brings the ecosystem back to an earlier successional stage and the process repeats. Looking at ecosystems in another way, we can consider the services that they provide. The ecosystems do things that no other system on the planet does. They cycle nutrients, they generate soil, they provide the initial input of matter and energy into the biological system, they give us food, they purify water, they provide us with the things that we use to build our society, they help regulate climate and mitigate effects of disturbances, and they also provide us with things like beauty and places to go and have interesting experiences. These are ecosystem services, and they are exclusively ecosystem services. There are no other ways to get these things on the planet other than through the action of ecosystems. With that in mind, it's incredibly important for us as humans to have functional ecosystems. And the function of an ecosystem is connected to its stability, which is in turn connected to the biodiversity that we see in that ecosystem. The more biodiverse an ecosystem is, the more stable it is, and the more able it is to recover after a particular disturbance. Not all ecosystems on the planet are created equal in terms of their productivity. In analyzing the different ecosystems on the planet, we've identified specific biodiversity hotspots, particularly in the tropical latitudes, which due to the amount of direct sunlight that they receive over the course of the year, tend to support tremendous amounts of global biodiversity. Similarly, the temperate ecosystems of the planet are major drivers of processes like transpiration and the production of things like breathable air, which are all bonuses, at least if you want, to remain alive. We have some understanding of where the biodiversity on the planet is, but importantly, most of the biodiversity on the planet remains undiscovered. The larger macroscopic organisms have, on the whole, been described pretty well, but microscopic organisms and other species that live in hard-to-access places remain undiscovered by biological science. This graph is showing us the various percentages of the species that have been discovered and the amount that remain as of yet undescribed or undiscovered, with the yellow area in the percentage discovered representing those unknown. That's a tremendous amount of undiscovered biodiversity that's still out there awaiting our biological discovery. But even though we haven't discovered it, we are acutely aware that the health of an ecosystem is connected to the biodiversity of that ecosystem. In general, larger ecosystems and ecosystems that are removed from human impacts and other disturbances in addition to natural disturbances tend to be healthier and more robust. This diagram is representing that fact with species area curves. The larger the area of the ecosystem, the more species we will find in that ecosystem, the more biodiverse it is. Without belaboring the point, we require functioning ecosystems in order to remain alive and healthy and within a functional human society. So it is in our interest as living organisms to try to keep our ecosystems as functional and healthy as possible into the indefinite future. Thanks for watching our video on ecosystems. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how facilitation and disturbance function within ecosystems. Make sure you can describe the value of biodiversity for ecosystem stability and human well-being. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.